the longest trip you will ever take is when you grow up and you finish school and you pack all your worldly goods into your car and you drive off to live your new adult life. I remember how I came to that journey. I had gone to Atlanta to visit some cousins. At the time, I was a school teacher, but I wasn't really happy with what I was doing. But I didn't know what else to do. And so I had gone to visit some cousins in Atlanta, and on my way home, I thought, I'm not going to drive the interstate. I'm going to take some side roads. Take the side roads. It's always so much more fun. And I'm driving down the road, and I thought, oh, this is better. There's so much more interesting stuff to look at on the side roads. What I saw was cow cow, cow, horse, cow, camel. And I went by so fast, I thought, I'm tired. I, did not, I just saw an arthritic horse. I did not see a camel. And there near the roadside was a little Baptist church, and they had a gravel parking lot, and I thought, it's a sign. Let us turn aside and see this thing which has come to pass. So I turned around in the gravel parking lot, and I went back, and sure enough, standing behind a barbed wire fence is a dromedary camel, just looking at me like, so? <laughs> and then I, I noticed a hand-painted sign that said, O'Kane's Wild Animal Park. Parking in rear, I thought, oh, I have to see this. So I turned up this lane, and I came to a brick ranch house, and there was a little parking lot in the back, and I stopped my car, and this guy came over on a riding mower, and he's pulling a trailer behind him, and the trailer is full of stuff that would not sell on the three-day-old produce stand at the Piggly Wiggly, you know, like wilted lettuce and dead carrots and stuff like that. And he says, you want to see my zoo? I said, well, I saw your camel by the side of the road and the sign, I was curious. He said, cost you $4. So okay. So I got $4. He said, climb. I'm on the back of this riding mower and I'll drive you around my zoo. Personal tour. So away we went. He drove me out in this big field and he had a prairie dog town. And there were all these little prairie dogs popping up and barking and jumping in and out of their holes. And I said, that is amazing. How did you get a prairie dog town? He said, are you a college graduate? I said, yes, sir. He said, they ain't teaching y'all anything. You get a male prairie dog, a female prairie dog, <laughs> dig a hole, throw them in there, spring, prairie dog town. <laughs> I said, oh, he said, I want you to feed the ostrich. He gave me a carrot and drove me over to the ostrich pen, this humongous thing. I mean, like a chicken on steroids. Puts its head down, grabs the carrot, and I swear to you, it did not swallow the carrot lengthwise. It went down sideways. You could watch it go all the way down. He had a family of raccoons in a little hollow tree. And then we drove up to this little building. You have one in your backyard, most likely. It's like a miniature barn, and you keep your lawnmower in there. He had one of those little sheds, and there was a huge combination padlock on the hasp on the front door. He hops off the ride mower, and he starts cranking that combination around. I said, what's in there? He said, this is my snake house. I thought, that just sounds nasty. It pretty much was. I thought... It won't be too bad. It'll be like some snakes in some fish tanks. Uh-uh, no, no, no. He had it all fixed up like a jungle with plants and a scene painted on the wall, and the big old snakes were just crawling around in there. I said, I'm not going in that. He said, they won't hurt you. I said, I know they won't because I'm not going in that. <laughs> he said, well, now, he said, I won't make you go in the snake house, but when we get the alligator pit, you've got to come in. I was like, oh, daggone it. Why didn't I just go in the snake house? We drove over to a pond. He had the pond circled with a big eight-foot chain-link fence with razor wire like you keep prisoners inside of. He said, I got ten alligators in here. And this was, it was kind of chilly weather. He said, their blood is kind of thick. He said, they can't move fast. Come on in and I'll introduce you. I was, by that point, I was kind of like in a daze. So he opened the gate and I followed him in there. And then I kind of came to myself and I saw an alligator floating and another one on an island and another one on the far bank and I started counting gators. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I counted again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I counted backward. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I said, didn't you tell me you had ten alligators? He said, yeah. He said, the tenth one is a mama with babies. 
I said, I've heard about that. You don't mess with a mama alligator with babies. He said, no, no, it's all right. She's dug herself a hole back in this bank here by the side of the pond. And if you want to see the alligator and her babies, just grab a hold of this sapling tree and kind of swing down and look back in that hole and you'll hear her like start bellering at you and she'll crawl out and you can see the babies rocking around on her head and her back and stuff. But then when you hear her beller, you need to come back up the bank real quick. I did it. It was like I was outside of my body watching myself. I grabbed hold of the sapling, swung down. Sure enough, bleh. I said, okay, I've had my excitement for the day. I went back to the car, and before I left, I said, how did you get a backyard full of exotic animals? And he said, son, I'm going to tell you something. He said, all I ever wanted to be when I was a kid was a zoologist. I was going to be a zookeeper. He said, other kids would say that. I meant it. But my daddy said, there ain't no money in that. You're going to work construction just like I did. He said, and my daddy was a very strong personality, and I could not tell him no. So I worked construction for 35 years, and I hated it. And I saved all of my money. And when I retired, I bought myself a zoo. <laughs> and then it was like... Light from heaven. He looked me dead in the eye. I mean, he didn't know me from Adam's house cap. And he said, don't wait 35 years to do what you really want to do. I went home and I told my mom, I said, I am going to quit school teaching and become a full-time storyteller. And she said, would you like fries with that? I said, it's what I really want to do. And so I thought, I need to be in a place that has a deeply rooted folk culture if I'm going to be a storyteller. So I moved to Charleston, South Carolina and found that a great place to begin work as a folklorist and storyteller is as a carriage driver in the historic district of Charleston, South Carolina. You've seen the carriages in the historic district. You dress in a polyester Confederate uniform and you stand at the wrong end of a horse, and you point with a buggy whip, and you tell the Yankees, this is this, and that is that, and this is this. And most of what you're telling them ain't even true, so you get lots of experience as a storyteller. This is this, and that is that. And when I started out as a carriage driver, I mean, I was as poor as Job's turkey. I had, did not have anything but the tip money that I begged for as a carriage driver. And when you start out, of course, the carriage drivers, they, it's kind of like being in the army or something. They're going to rag you a little bit, and they have their own initiations. When you do your first solo tour, they feed your horse bananas so that it will have horrid gas. <laughs> And you're trying to make a living and your horse is punctuating your sentences as you go down the street. I didn't have enough money for a car. I rode a bicycle back and forth to work. I lived in a little tiny efficiency apartment north of Calhoun Street. It was like living in the lowest cabin on a cruise ship. My apartment was so small I could sit on the toilet and do dishes at the same time. <laughs> I had hawked my class ring from high school. I had hawked my college ring. I was determined. I ate Fruit Loops for supper, but I was determined to not go home. But I was so horribly homesick, I could hardly stand it. One night, I had worked at the carriage company until about 7 o'clock at night. I put my horse away got on my bicycle, and I went whizzing up from the historic market area up Anson Street, and as I passed Galliard Auditorium, across the street from the auditorium, I saw all lit up in the dimming light of the evening St. John's Reformed Episcopal Church. They had no air conditioning, and so they had all the shutters on the windows thrown open, and they were having Thursday night experience meeting. And you could hear the singing and they were singing songs like Victory in Jesus and On Jordan's Stormy Banks from the Shape Note Hymn Book. Songs of my childhood. And I stopped my bicycle and I climbed off my bike and I'm standing there and I'm listening to those people sing and I could feel tears trickling down and the salt burning my hot sunburnt cheeks. And all of a sudden, there was a presence just behind me. And I turned, and there was a lady, a black lady, 
who I am sure if we knew her whole family lineage, we would find out that even though she descended from slaves, those slaves were captured from Nubian royalty. She was like a queen. She was dressed all in purple. She had on a purple hat. She had on a purple suit. She had on a purple silk blouse with a big purple silk bow. She had on purple pantyhose and purple shoes. And a little boy standing next to her dressed in orange. <laughs> I figured he was adopted. <laughs> and she said, I can see that you're moved. Come in and praise the Lord with us. And I said, oh, ma'am. I said, I have been working at the carriage company all day. I smell or horrible. I look worse. I cannot come to a worship service. But those songs were a great blessing to me. And she said, God don't care how you look long as you show up. Now I can see you moved. I can see you need this. I want you to come in. And she helped me through the door. And when she got behind you to help you, there was no going back. So you just <laughs> went in. So I walk into St. John's Reformed Episcopal Church, which was founded just after the Civil War, as the historians say, for free people of color. And I realize I am dressed in a Confederate uniform. <laughs> The singing stopped. <laughs> and the pastor, in a most dignified fashion, stood up and took a microphone and said, we have a visitor. <laughs> and brought the microphone to me and asked me if I would introduce myself to this congregation. So I told him my name was Tim and that I was new to Charleston and their singing was a great blessing to me. He said, that's just fine. You're most welcome here. Sit with your new friend. So I sat with the purple lady and her orange son. <laughs> and they went back to singing. It was an anniversary service for their church Thursday night experience meeting, and they sang and sang and sang. There was a women's choir, there was a men's choir, there was a soloist, and then it came time for the offering, and all the Sunday school children marched up front with money, and I wanted to do my part, so I fished into my pocket, and I got out a $5 bill, and I handed a little boy an orange. He started up front, and his mama saw him leave the pew and go forward with money, and she grabbed a hold of him, and he turned around, and she said, where'd you get that money? He said, the white boy gave it to me. She told him to go ahead. He went up and put my money in the offering plate. And then after the offering, the choir came down from the choir loft, and they sat with the congregation, and it was time for the preaching. I grew up a Baptist preacher's kid. I thought I knew what preaching was all about. I had never heard preaching like that in my life. It was fabulous. First, there was a reading of the text, and the text began from the Gospels, and the preacher read in English, Jesus was walking on the road, and then he switched to Gullah, the seacoast island language of the South Carolina slaves, and I started my lifelong love affair with the beautiful Gullah language and Gullah culture. And what he said to the congregation was, Jesus been walking on top of the road there, and they've been all kind of people say they're going to go out with him. And one man, he said, he going to go with the Lord, but he got to go home and bury a pie because he probably dead. He got to go home and bury a pie. And Jesus said, let the pie lay in the graveyard. You come with the Lord. He said, he can't go with him. And then another man said, he going to go with Jesus, but he got to go home and tell all the family. Hey, old Bubba. He said, don't go home and tell the family. Hey, old Bubba, come on with Jesus now. But he said, he can't go with him. And all kind of people say they're going to go with Jesus, but then they all fall out and they ain't going to go. And Jesus, he just shake his head. He said, mm-mm, the man that put his hand to the plow and then Kathy, yeah, back toward home. He ain't fit for work in my field. <laughs> and then he said, this is a story about Jesus on the road. And then he said, now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to turn to the person on your right and say, get on the road. So we all turned to the person on our right and we said, get on the road. And then he said, now you turn to the people on your left and you say, I said, get on the road. So we all turned and said, I said, get on the road. He said, you're on the road, ladies and gentlemen. You're on a journey with the Lord and you've got to stay on the road with him. Do not get sidetracked. Do not get distracted. Stay on the road. And he launched into a sermon. I mean, he stopped just short of naming names. He said, you women come to me, you come to me, and you say, oh, pray for me. God done close up my womb, and I can't have no baby. So we pray, and God perform a miracle, and you got five children, and I ain't none of them in Sunday school. <laughs> and I go to you, and I say, why are these children not in Sunday school? You say, oh, I got one in diapers. I got one allergic to everything. I just don't know what I'm going to do. You take God's blessing and turn it into a curse. Get on the road. 
I said, you boys come to me. You say, I can't get a job because I ain't got a car. We pray and get you a car. I say, why ain't you in church? They say, ooh, I'm washing my car. Get the car on the road to the church and the Sunday school. Get on the road. And people say, get on the road. And I noticed that the organist had not left the organ bench. She stayed. And I realized now she was there to punctuate his sentences. She started going, bum, 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 bum. I mean, it's like a Cincinnati Reds baseball game. Bum, 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 bum. It was building to a climax. And he said, you may be on the road following the Lord, and you may feel down, and you may feel weary, and you may feel all by yourself. But I am here to tell you, you are never alone. The Holy Spirit is with you everywhere you go. And then I knew God was talking directly to me because I felt so alone. The Holy Spirit in the Greek is called paraclete. Let me put that down where you live. He is your parachute. He will help you if you fall. He is your parasol. He will shield you from a storm. He is your paralegal. He will help you in a time of trial. He is your paratrooper. He will steal the enemy and the avenger. He is your paramedic. He will save your sin, sick soul. And the orders went, doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> the shouting. I never heard that much shouting unless somebody brought snakes out in the church. Oh, my word. It was marvelous. And then it all came down very calmly and peacefully. And after he prayed, the oldest member of the congregation stood up and started to sing. I'm just a poor wayfaring stranger a traveling through this world of woe. There's just a few more days to labor before I fly to my heavenly home. And we all filed out. I knew that song. Black people sing it, but it's actually an Appalachian folk song from my childhood in the mountains of Kentucky. When we went out on the sidewalk, I unlocked my bicycle where I had leaned it against a tree and the purple lady came over to give me a hug. It would be more correct to say she surrounded me completely. <laughs> and she whispered in my ear, Honey, if you miss your mama, just come here to St. John's, because here you is family. And that was the end of that. Thank you all so much. Be careful driving home. Stay on the road. <laughs>